Good morning. Thank you, Tom. I'm really excited. We have a great panel today of uh, four people who are leading companies that range in size from about 12 employees to 50 plus, and they're leading their companies from four different countries. So with that, let's bring on our panel. Um, first, we'll start with Magna Ilsis. He's the founder of Decode, and he is based in Norway. And we have Alex Frizong. He's the co-founder of Impside, and he's based in Germany. <laughs> Ilona Filippi, she's the co-founder of Move, based out of the UK. <laughs> and Matt Johnson is the co-founder of Alley Interactive, and he is based in the US, in New York City. Thank all of you for being here. I'd like to start with a, a brief overview, if you could do by raise of hands, um, whether you are 100% remote in your agency. Okay, so one 100% remote, and what about uh, fully? <laughs> depends, depends on your we'll, we'll get to the, we'll get to the definition, uh, and what about fully in one location? almost in one location, and then two that are quasi office-based and remote, correct? Great. So the focus of our talk is about cultivating happy teams and how that makes for better business. So I'd like to start by just understanding the true cost of an employee and recruiting employees. So Alona, if you want to start, maybe tell us about your first time recruiting a new employee what you went through, and uh, yeah. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, so Move Agency is six years old now, and we evolved over the time. Um, we started as two co-founders initially, and now we are 12 employees, and we're uh, what we call hybrid uh, environment, which means uh, we all work from offices, but in three different locations. Um, so what, what that means is uh, we have office based culture that transfers uh, same kind of one location. We use Slack extensively, uh, we use Google Hangouts uh, extensively, Google Docs, etc. So um, in that, that regards, just to introduce it. Um, half of our company is in London where we uh, source all our business. So essentially, uh, we, we work with UK-based customers and we have our development resources um, across Europe. And the way we uh, hire our first employees uh, back in the days, uh, because we were very small, starting up, um, very cautious, we started with interns and uh, then grown into uh, fantastic employees over time. So that was great. However, now we are a mature company. We need senior people. So we uh, tend to hire through various means. We use recruiters, we use our own ads, uh, we go to networking events, etc. So uh, it's a combination. Uh, oftentimes we also try to um, grow people uh, inside of the company. So we recruit from universities, etc. and then train them uh, to be uh, WordPress developers. Matt, are your new hires ready to go on day one, or is there an onboarding process that you go through? Um, well, it depends. I mean, we, we want to be able to hire people at a bunch of different levels. Um, we, we've definitely hired people who were, so anyone that we hire needs to be able to hit the ground running with PHP. And we're talking, we're, we, have, we have a number of different roles, but I'm speaking primarily about people who are going to be WordPress developers. Um, so we, we're willing to hire people who are, who can demonstrate knowledge of PHP, um, and we believe they are intelligent and will be able to pick up the basics of WordPress and be able to start contributing to WordPress based on their knowledge of PHP. We also are very happy and have a number of cases have hired people who are very familiar with WordPress, who are often very plugged into the WordPress community. Um, so every hire that we, we make, we really approach very contextually. And we, we try to figure out, is this person a good fit for our team, a good fit for the type of work that we're doing at the time? And do we think that they have the, the, the prospects to grow at Alley and eventually take on greater roles and contribute more and more to the team? 
Alex, as a fully remote agency, have you focused historically on trying to hire WordPress designers and developers, or have you brought in people to WordPress that had knowledge of uh, the technologies that we use in WordPress? I mean, it's a mix. Like um, sometimes people approaching us at a um, yeah at a WordCamp or something like this, and of course they know already WordPress or they have an application and. Um, or we know them because they did some patches for any plugins or um, just they're in the WordPress scene. But sometimes we also have some uh, people they never had any contact with uh, WordPress before. You know? So for us it's very important that they, um, yeah, they have talents for code writing and um, you know, there's also potential to getting better and uh, this is very um, important for us. Uh, our um, codex is even more restrict than uh, WordPress codex and um, when we start to hire, um, we ask them for uh, you know some code what they have. Then they have we do have some um, task specific tasks for them, and after that we do have a telephone call and check out is it also not you know if the co code quality is very good. Um, this is the first step, and the second step is like um, is the person um, the right one and fits in our team like personal wise. So this is very important. And Magna is a more of a landlocked agency. Uh, recruiting has surely been more of a challenge to get people with built-in WordPress knowledge. So how have y'all managed to either recruit people with WordPress knowledge or onboard them uh, to be familiar with your platform and be ready to go? Uh, I think in, in Norway it's, a, it's really a mix. Uh, Norway uh, WordPress is, is just getting really popular. So in the beginning we had to, there are some developers and, and people working on WordPress that are really into the community, into WordPress, so that's easy. Uh, but we really have, have to tap into uh, other skill sets as well and, and, uh, and kind of teach them the WordPress way, uh, way and introduce them to the community through uh, these events like these. Um, and also, um, uh, we have a bunch of different roles who are not developers, uh, and uh, so we, we really have to compete with other agencies, not WordPress agencies. Uh, and uh, so, so for these different skills. And how many employees do each of you have? And we'll start over here and just work our way across. Yeah, we're 20 now. Okay. Same. The same. 20. We're 12. We're uh, 52, I believe, at last count. And are the majority of all of your workforces full time? Ours are entirely full time. Yeah. Okay. So. We have this establishment here where we have employees, we have people working for you. And we want to focus on how do you keep your teams happy um, so that you can have tenure, uh, so that you can have people that actually stick around. So I'd like to start and say, Matt, how long do you consider long enough to where you feel like someone has uh, stuck with you and has provided value that it was worth the investment that you made hiring them? Um, I would say, I mean, we, we want people to stick around as long as possible. We, we have a, a couple of, uh, we have one of the things that I think may be sort of unique to, to us, I, I don't know if other agencies are doing this, but we, we start providing a quarterly profit sharing bonus every quarter once someone has been employed for one year. So that's kind of the, the, the point at which we say, like, you've made a real commitment to our team and we're going to start staking you into how the company is actually doing. And this is part of our, our commitment to really, like, very significant transparency with our team. Like, we really open the books about how the company is doing financially and business-wise to our team. We really believe the people who work for us are smart. They, it doesn't make sense to withhold information like that from them. Um, so as soon as someone's been around for a year, that really, that kicks in. But even before a year, we still... Um, can tell pretty quickly if someone is making significant contributions to the company. Um, so we have um, <laughs> we have that uh, we we have that metric, but we also um, have in, in a lot of cases we have very significant tenure. I mean, we have people who've been around for two and a half, three, um, even close to four years at this point, um, who are uh, and you know that's. Uh, that is a, is a, you know, there's a mixture of people like who've been around for less than a year. But I would say that's like a significant chunk of the company's total time it's been around, which is six and a half years. Um, and, you know, we also, 
over time, our, our like ultimate promotion is that someone can make partner in the sense of how law firms work in the United States. And Brad, who's sitting over there near the front, was the first person at Alley to make partner. Um, so that's, we, we have a lot of um, uh, like paths to promotion within the company that we can recognize people who've been around longer and longer periods of time. Ilona, uh, beyond things like beanbag chairs in the office, how do you cultivate employee happiness and um, a positive team culture? So the way we look at it at Move, um, all, all these benefits that you're talking about, um, we also almost consider it standard uh, within our industry. Um, unlimited holidays, uh, working uh, hours that you choose, uh, team retreats, etc. So um, th that's the basics. But we look uh, more deeply into motivations of uh, employees that we look for, those who are ambitious, who are really passionate about what they do. We want people to really like what they do. Um, so it extends into the kind of projects that we uh, tend to work on. And we're very selective. Um, we're not a typical agency in that sense because uh, we want to work on things that move us forward, that are exciting for our team to, uh, to work on, that uh, enhance our portfolio, um, that are uh, interesting in, uh, in all sorts of aspects, but that, that is uh, some new uh, API to be integrated or a larger scale or large client that's interesting to work with. So for us, it's uh, especially about the type of work because the people that we like to work with, that we believe fit our culture, um, come to work because they want to move forward in, in, in their careers, in, uh, in their skill set, etc. So it's a, it's a type of work that, uh, that we uh, bring in apart from all of the usual stuff. And the demand in your market has been high enough that you can be more selective so that the clients that come in are um, exciting projects for, for employees? Well, that's a good uh, question. Um, we all wish there would be uh, more projects, but uh, that's where um, the leadership comes in, uh, which says um, instead of growing uh, for the sake of growing, we'll be uh, growing at a pace that allows us to pick the right projects for, for our team. Um, there's a concept that's been popularized over the past couple of years in the WordPress community and agencies um, called Five to the Future, which is something that Matt Mullenweg uh, discussed a couple of years ago, and it's about contributing 5% of your time or your workforce's time back to the community. Have any of y'all tried doing this or something similar, and what kind of success have you seen? I mean, we do quite a bit for the community. We also are co-organizing like WordCamps in Germany, or we have also like uh, plugins available, and uh, some of them, um, you know, um, really are participating to um, develop or have some patches for the core development and all the stuff. And also that we go to WordCamps together and have a retreat and uh, with a whole team that we go there. And uh, yeah, sessions, speaking sessions, and all the stuff uh, on WordCamps. So we really support that because we are from the community. We we were created uh, or we met in first place in the community. So and then we started the agency. And so we always give back because we also receive a lot. So this is very important for us. And um, this is um, yeah. Also, our employees there really like to um, provide something to the community because it's it's a good thing, you know. Because and uh, also. Um, yeah, like I said, we receive a lot of it. Does anyone else have a specific program in place at their company for contributing back to uh, the WordPress community? Or is it more self-selective? Well, uh, again, we're a strange little country up north. And, and uh, <laughs> since uh, it's us introducing a lot of the employees to the WordPress community, um, uh, uh, and we're not used to necessarily the, the, the way of sharing. Uh, so code-wise, we do some contributions, but uh, I think our biggest contribution is to help uh, moving WordPress in, into a position uh, where it's popular enough so that the community can grow and there's actually uh, work to be found for more people. And I think as the community and as businesses in Norway um, mature, uh, there will be more contribu contributions towards the uh, kind of the code code part of uh, of WordPress. So um, uh, for us, it's about organizing meetups and, and WordPress uh, WordCamp Norway and so on. Yeah. 
I would just add briefly that one of the, we, we don't have like a dedicated 5% policy, um, but we do, one of the things that we do try to apply as a strategy when we're building projects for clients is to try to work with clients to sell them on the benefits of underwriting an open source project. And we've had a pretty significant amount of success with some clients. One of our oldest clients, which is the a health policy research firm called the Kaiser Family Foundation in the US, um, they uh, essentially sponsored us to build a plugin called Field Manager, which is a, a at this point, very robust uh, meta manager for WordPress that we've released as open source and we've had a significant amount of community involvement from outside Alley. In. And that was something where we got a client to, as part of the project they were paying us to do anyway, to build code that was going to be releasable to the whole community and that we would continue to support. And in exchange for which they would get like sort of a recognition and, and goodwill from the community for it. So we try to create those sort of like public-private partnerships, if you will, um, when, we, when we work with clients. So we have, we have a number of projects that have grown out of that, that type of cooperation. What role does salary play in creating happy employees? And um, this is a hairy subject a lot of times because uh, salary is something that we don't talk about a lot. And it also varies greatly depending on where the employee is located, where the company is located. So when you're recruiting new employees, um, I'd like to hear maybe from Magna from a, uh, from a local sense and then uh, Alex from a remote sense. Um, how do you negotiate salary and how do you find a middle ground so that it's good for the company, so that singular employees are not uh, getting too much salary, you know, income away from the company, but also so that you're uh, fully equipping this employee and enticing them to do their best work? Uh, I think the most important thing is that uh, we, we try to establish a culture and we try to learn from uh, the WordPress community and, and kind of the openness and, and uh, the way of thinking through working on WordPress and to create a really good work culture uh, and to have a, a, a work culture where, where people can um, really take responsibility if they want to. And, and by creating an attractive work environment, uh, now we're attracting really good people who um, uh, where salary is of course important, uh, but they also understand that we're, uh, we've been a, a startup company that we need to kind of grow into uh, uh, not higher standards, but higher salaries and, and bigger projects and bigger income. So it's a uh, it's a step by step process, uh, I think. Yeah, and, and we're 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 it's sometimes really hard because we're competing against non WordPress companies. And there are maybe two, three, four, five hundred employees, uh, and of course uh, they have a, a different uh, economy. Uh, so it's really important to to also focus on the the non-economic uh, 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 sides on building company. I mean, like he says, um, you know, we competing with other uh, agencies or corporate companies, and they offer a much better salary most of the time. But you know, we do also have some other benefits. You know, people. They are liberal in their work time. Um, we um, they have a, a lot, you know, interesting uh, projects, and um, also um, we give them a lot of trust and responsibility, which they really like, and uh, they can do a lot of their own. And this, these are um, quite important benefits to the um, comparing also to the salary. And um, because of the location, since we are remote, we don't um, have any salary because of any location. Um, it's because of the quality of their work. Ilona, what's the number one benefit that you've been able to provide employees to um, help create satisfaction? Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose choose, choose their own hours. Well, I wouldn't say one, number one benefit, but uh, choose their own hours, um, take as much holidays as, as they need, uh, work um, independently. Um, I suppose the combination of all three where you give the um, environment to the employees to, to especially senior type of employees that they can work on using their own initiative and, uh, and feel like they're part of something that they're building, not just a small wheel in a, in a big, big machine. And Matt, same question. 
Well, you know, there's perks, perks and benefits are good, but I think that what really keeps people around is the, the chance to work with really great coworkers and on really engaging projects. Um, so that's, that's one of the best things that I think we can give people. The other, but probably the most important, like, actual perk that we can give people is that um, they're freed from the, the tyranny of, a, like, physically attending an office from <laughs> 9 to 5, which if you, you, if you Europeans have heard that there's, like, a very oppressive overwork culture in the United States, that's quite true. And freeing people from that system is like an immense benefit. Like my wife has a job where she has to be chained to a desk from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, and it like really affects her happiness with her job. So I see that firsthand, that contrast between what she has to go through and why she's looking for another job right now and what our employees can sort of structure just, just to take like a small amount of like flex in their schedule or their ability to not have to commute on a day that it doesn't work for them to, um, to, and really, like that, that causes an immense increase in anyone's happiness that, that I've seen. So I think that's one of the most important benefits that we offer. Great, thank you. And I believe we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. While, go ahead. Do you, do you wanna go ahead? No, I was gonna say, well, while you're grabbing the first questioner, yeah. I, I have a filler between them. I would love your filler. I would um, like to... If you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay. And we'll listen to Brian's filler. How many of you have managed to grow your companies from 1 to 12 to 20 to 50 using a retainer-based model where you have long-term clients where employees spend a number of hours per week or month or something on them? Everybody? And have you found that an effective route for uh, being able to grow, to have that steady income that's, okay. I thought so, I just wanted to make sure. Um, okay, so um, hopefully we have our first questioner. Um, I would say when you ask your question, um, it would also be useful if you um, make it clear whether that question is for the entire panel or for someone specific, um, so that we know who it's directed to. Um, okay, uh, I help run an agency in Bulgaria, and um, I'm kind of, wanting to open things up to flex time and more open holidays. And half of our employees are very into that. And half of our employees really like that rigid standard schedule. So this is kind of for Iana, um, how you balance employees that want that flexible holiday time with employees that just want that very formal work environment. Thank you. Um, so to answer the question, uh, we still currently have uh, all our employees coming to the office. Uh, so it's not that some work from home, uh, all of them come to the office. Uh, it's just that we're across three locations. You can think of it as three offices. Uh, but we're thinking of moving uh, into even more remote uh, working model where people can choose simply the, whether they want to work from home or coming to the office, it, it'll be their choice. And uh, our processes are ready for it already because we have these three offices. And uh, the way uh, we will manage it is, uh, I suppose, as every other uh, remote company, uh, there'll be some core hours where we would expect people to be online. Um, and um, we, we might meet uh, initially once or twice a week um, in, in the offices, but um, I don't see it being such a big uh, difference uh, as, as it might seem initially. Um, however, you do need to uh, accommodate for the people who do like the, the office type of environment, that they like the separation between work and personal life and who, who feel more productive in, in the office space, which uh, uh, for us uh, also is uh, at least 50%, maybe, maybe even 80% of our employees. So um, giving them the option, I think, is the best. Maybe downgrading the, the, the big office and allowing 50% of, of your people working from home and 50% still coming to uh, some, some environment might be the answer, which we are looking into as well, <laughs> by the way. Do you have another one ready to go? Um, hi, my name is Martin. Um, I have a question for the whole panel. Do you 
use any form? Do you have like a weekly short meeting? How do you actually assess if somebody is happy or is not happy? Because I mean, uh, in order to, to make your team happy, first you need to know where the people stand, right? Especially if you're not in the same office all day, you don't pick up on the little clues, right? Somebody's probably not looking so good or uh, you don't have like a coffee corner talk about what's going on and how people are performing. So how do you actually find out if the people are happy or not and what to do about it? I mean, since we are a remote office, uh, it's more difficult. That's right. And um, we do have uh, talks, like one-on-one -on -one or also in a team. How frequently do you do this? Um, we have like in the team once a week. And one-on-one -on -one, um, depends if they really want to. But they always know, uh, know that the door is open. And we also um, emphasize that they can say everything. I mean, we are open for critics. Um, we are open for new ideas, for everything. It's not like, OK, uh, they are right and uh, the employee are wrong or something like this. Um, really want to have the feedback and sometimes um, you get to it's it's kind of an experience that you know okay they have something on their chest to talk about but they don't so you really um, emphasize them to say like hey what's going on or what's wrong or maybe also with the teammate or on a project it's always good we have really like an open community kind of um, and everybody has has a voice and this is very important for us and um, so um, there we can find out if they are happy or not. And if they're not happy, we can always talk about it and try to you know, find a solution or change something. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been good for that. So. Does anyone have a significantly different one-on-one -on -one feedback policy? Well, I, so we, I think we, we do something that's a little unusual. It, maybe it's not. But um, since our projects are organized on like a sort of ad hoc and rolling basis, we, just, we don't have like direct supervisors. What we have instead of something called coaching, where each person has a coach who's not their boss, but they're their sort of advocate yeah. slash mentor. And that's the main forum where someone would be able to, to explain to their coach, like, because we have, you know, you have a weekly or bi-weekly meeting with your coach, and at that point you can talk about, like, how's it going? How do you feel about what you're currently working on? Are you engaged? Are you bored? Do you want a different challenge? Stuff like that. And then we have every, twice a year we have reviews where coaches come together and, like, we compile all the feedback about everyone, and we tell, we tell the, the team members how we think they're doing, and that's also a forum for them to kind of tell us how we're doing and just come together about how we're all feeling about their relationship to the company. Um, and so that, that's been actually, it took us a while to get to that system, but it's been a really helpful forum for like decentralizing the feedback channels to make it actually scale to 50 people. Because it used to be that I, as one of the partners, could talk to every employee. When we were 10 people, I could definitely do that. I can't really do that when we're 50 people. Like, I can't talk to them once a week. It's just too many people. So this, was, this has been really helpful to kind of like, you know, make it a peer-to-peer feedback system in a sense. All right. Thank you very much. If anyone has additional questions, you can track these folks down uh, yeah. outside. And I am sure I can speak on behalf of all of them when I say they're probably hiring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.